Hello, friends, and welcome to, uh, I guess this is episode three of Let's Meet in the Kitchen. My name is Hans Rupert, and we are in my personal kitchen, uh, which is sometimes known as the Gesundheit Kitchen, where we do a regular series for the Gastro Cancer Foundation, um, talking about good foods and good ways to prepare them and how they affect your body. And uh, although this is typically geared for those that have had somewhat of a gastric um, sort of compromise, I guess, if you will, where we're having either no stomach or partial stomach, uh, the types of foods that we'd like to prepare typically are great foods for everybody. So uh, if you have somehow ended up on this and you're thinking, why did I end up on a uh, stomach cancer page? Well, if you eat food, uh, welcome. You don't have to be stomachless to be uh, in this fun little club. Um, but we do like to sort of celebrate food. And uh, during this time of sort of sheltering in and staying in place, we wanted to try to recreate a sense of community because obviously when, uh, when you're stuck at home, oftentimes you get a little stir crazy and get, uh, get lost for inspiration uh, when it comes to things to eat. And so we've been trying to revisit the pantry uh, over this uh, series. Like I said, this is our third uh, installment and we've got one more coming up next week. And so each week I'm trying to challenge myself a little bit by using these on-hand ingredients and also hopefully inspire you guys to, uh, to revisit some of these classics or to think about food slightly differently. So um, we are streaming live, which means you're probably going to see a cat streaming by or you might hear my birds uh, chirping in the distance, uh, which is all fine and good. And, uh, but we do encourage that you give a little shout out, say hello from wherever you're watching. Uh, we've had people from as far away as Russia and Scotland and Germany. Um, so we'd love to see who's, uh, who's playing along with us. And also if you have any questions or comments or ideas that you want to shout out, uh, now's the time to do it as well. So, um, let's jump in. Now I was kind of, um, thinking like, what should we do? And actually my friend Hewitt, who's the, the guy, uh, behind all the computer stuff here and has been my, my producer and cameraman and friend for many, many years, uh, suggested I do something with stir fry because I think that's something that uh, as you learn to cook and as you get into the kitchen, that's something we all want to master. In fact, that was one of the first things um, that I played around with when I started uh, learning how to cook with stir fry. And my, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, had to endure many a, a sort of bad meal along the way. Uh, as I kind of learned my way through that. So we're going to put together a stir fry using uh, frozen veggies, which is something that uh, is always your second option behind fresh. But again, if you're, if you're trying to use up things that are in your pantry or in your freezer, this is a great way to do that. Uh, and I'm going to be serving it on brown rice. Now, I always like to invite my friend, Dr. Ellen Steinberg, to talk about the nutrition of things and uh, kind of play with the science of all of that. Um, but she is going to have to just uh, pop in and then pop out. She has uh, real work to do. Um, so I've invited her to come and just talk for a moment about the difference and the quality uh, between brown rice versus white rice. So Ellen, thanks again for, for hopping in with us. Todd said he's going to be preparing a dish today with brown rice and basically white rice kind of used to be brown rice before people uh, kind of process it and remove the husk, the bran, and the germ. So what happens when you remove all that, you're actually also removing the fiber, the good, the higher amount of protein, and a lot of uh, good minerals, vitamins and minerals. So basically you're starting out with a very good product, you're removing all that, and you're stripping away some of the nutrients that you would want in a rice. What's interesting is, is after they do that, some white rice, if you look on the package, it may say enriched, which means they're putting back the vitamins and minerals they just removed. So while you want that protein, um, you can get more in a small amount than you would with white rice. And another thing is, is that fiber that we talk so much about, which is great for gut health, all those microbiota in your gut. It's also good for lowering, naturally lowering cholesterol and just overall health. So if you have a choice between brown and white, I say always go for the brown. Also uh, remember, while brown rice may be a little bit more filling, it's also that's a good thing because you're getting more bang for your buck, so to speak. So if choosing between the two, I say go for the brown rice. And uh, I'll let Hans take it away and talk about the difference perhaps of cooking different cooking times for brown versus white rice. So thanks, Hans. Thank you, Ellen. I always appreciate you uh, chiming in with us. It's fantastic to have you. I, 
I love the little picture of the dog behind you. Probably didn't, uh, I don't know if everybody got to see that or not, but uh, land your side. There we go. I love that. It's fantastic. Uh, perfect. Well, go enjoy the rest of your day. Go you get back to work. Um, Ellen, like I said, is a longtime friend, and uh, so it's fun to have her in the kitchen even when she's not in the kitchen with me. So this has been a fun way to kind of be virtually share some time together, uh, which I think a lot of folks are doing, the, the Zoom calls and Facebook Live and, uh, of course, uh, you know, FaceTime and all those things. So, uh now, I will say that normally I'm not a kitchen gadget kind of a guy, but I have fallen in love with my rice cooker. And this is not an endorsement, it's just a personal, you know, testimony. Uh, it is the Zuji Roshi, which has a little elephant on there, and uh, did, my, did my homework, and that was the brand that uh, seemed to be kind of everybody loved. And I went into that, you know, kind of a little hesitant, thinking, well, I can cook rice in a pot. Uh, but I will say when it comes to the kind of chewier rices, whether it's red bamboo rice or black rice or what they call forbidden rice, which, you know, it's not really forbidden, um, nothing illegal rice-wise going on here, but brown rice can be a little uh, tricky and it has a brown rice setting and it is, you, you throw it in there, you push the button and it does its own thing. And the great thing is, is that if you don't catch it like right at the moment, it really does a great job of holding it for for a long time. So you can set it in the morning. And, and again, I'm I'm just not personally a fan of a lot of these you know these kitchen counter gadgets that seem to do everything. But the rice cooker, I will say, I'm I have now been uh, I've I've had the Kool Aid as it were. Um, so I'm all about the rice cooker. So that worked perfectly for the brown rice. Now. Uh, even using an automated device, though, it's almost twice the cooking time uh, versus white rice. Uh, so you do have to allow about two hours. So given that, I tend to cook a lot of it, knowing that I can then repurpose it in, in any different way. So I don't spice it on the front end so that I can use it as a, you know, as a breakfast if I wanted to do something slightly sweet um, with brown rice. Or if I wanted to do something savory, I can take it in, in either direction. So I go ahead and cook the whole deal. So let's get into the stir fry. Now, I think um, the, the tricky part of this for, for beginners is this high heat aspect. So I am, I'm gonna use olive oil because it's the one that we all tend to have, but I'm not gonna get it so hot that we're, there's smoke everywhere. So if you, if you love doing like high heat temperature, don't use olive oil, use something like avocado oil or grapeseed oil. Um, that has a higher smoking point. But what I want to do is do my aromatics first, have those kind of flavoring uh, the fat. In this case, it's the oil, because the oil then acts as the carrier. It's the, it's the vehicle that kind of distributes the, the spice, or in this case, the, uh, our aromatics, which are going to be chopped ginger and chopped garlic. So I've got two cloves of garlic, fresh, and I, I leave them in slices because I like to have actual bites of, of ginger and garlic in here. Um, but for the ginger, I didn't have a, a fresh ginger root on hand at the moment. And uh, so I'm using a prepared ginger paste. And like all things, I mean, you can, you can find different grades of things. This one I got from an Asian market and um, very simple ingredients and it also very pungent. I mean, so from the moment that you open the glass refrigerated jar, uh, you get that, that waft of, of real ginger. So I'm gonna add that, uh, a good teaspoon of ginger to my oil early on. Now there is water in the, in the ginger naturally, and so when it hits the hot oil, it does pop a little bit. Uh, and I, when I was a young kid, when my dad would make things like this, I was always afraid of those little, little jumping pieces. But um, they're, you know, they might sting like a little mosquito if they hit you hard, but for the most part, they're, they're mostly harmless. And so I just wanna sweat that around until, again, I want that flavor of all three things here to kind of wake up and get those essential oils out of the garlic, the ginger, and the onion. Now, depending on where you are and your gastric cancer or um, your, your journey, or even, even if you are a fully stomach person, some people tolerate onions better than others. Uh, if onions are a little too rough for you, you can omit them. Um, it, honestly, that's the great thing about stir fry is it's so uh, customizable. You can take it in, in any direction and no, there's no hard and fast rule to any of this. Um, so once these start to get translucent, um, they, they lose that bite, the flavor is full. If I were using fresh veggies, I would put them in now, and depending on the length of time it takes to cook them, sometimes you have to do it in stages. So if you have like a, a harder vegetable, uh, or if for example, you're using a full head of broccoli, fresh broccoli, and you wanted to use the stems, uh, after you peeled the stems, you could put those in now because they take a little bit longer to cook. 
In this case, I'm using mostly frozen vegetables, but I had a little bit of broccolini in my refrigerator. And broccolini is basically sometimes marketed as baby broccoli, although that term always kind of upset me a little bit, like they went and stole this baby from its mama. Uh, but really, it, uh, sometimes it's also called Chinese broccoli. It's just a different variety, mainly, of broccoli that instead of, instead of forming one large flower head, because essentially these are the flower heads, it puts them on these um, stalks. And you're seeing now what used to be called, uh, and sometimes is still seen as Chinese cauliflower, is now being marketed as Kalalini. So you'll see broccolini or baby broccoli or Kalalini or baby cauliflower. But this is the same sort of tenderness all the way down this thin stalk. So I'm gonna throw these in now uh, because these would take a lot longer than the frozen veg that already has been cooked. So now these I have thawed uh, and I did so overnight and I did so in a colander to get all of the excess liquid out. Now this is almost a um, stereotypical Asian blend, they call it, with um, sugar snap or snow peas, water chestnuts, carrots, and broccoli. And they're bright green, they've already been cooked, so I don't want them to have too much time in the, uh, in the cooking process because otherwise they're just gonna go downhill. You know, I, if you've ever seen me talk food before, food is this sort of this bell curve, I guess you could say, where it's a, uh, there's this, this drop off where food is good, 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 it's great, and then all of a if you cook food too long, especially greens, you kind of get that tapering off effect, and I don't want these to be so overcooked that they become mushy, uh, which sometimes frozen vegetables have a little, they've lost some of that pop, that crunch. So again, not much cooking time. I don't want it to be where it spends too much time in this uh, hot, Skillet. Now this particular skillet happens to have curved edges. You can use a wok if you have a have a wok. This is, I guess, somewhere between a wok and a and a you know a standard skillet. Um, but the center of the pan is going to be the hottest. So I'm going to kind of put these guys around the edge while I add a little liquid in here, as well as I want to have a, just a slight sweet bite. This is a fermented plum paste called ume. And again, we'll have a look in my pantry here in a bit. There are, uh, you know, some things that you might not have. You don't need this, but I have it, and it works well with this. It has a um, kind of a savory, kind of a sweet, kind of a sour. It's sort of all of those, even a little umami happening there. Uh, a little goes a long way. So I'm going to put just about a half a teaspoon of this ume paste in here. And I need that to kind of work its way through the dish. Let me get my veggies back in here. Now, I'm going to add a little Bragg's liquid amino acids. Now, you can use soy sauce. Some folks have uh, gluten issues. This is a gluten-free alternative, and it also has a lot of the essential uh, amino acids that our body needs. So it's sort of a, you could say, like a health food uh, alternative to soy sauce. But Again, very similar flavor profile. This is where the salt of the dish comes from. The, the, the ume paste has a little salt happening there, but it's this, again, you would use it just as you would use soy sauce. And then I wanna use a little bit of uh, toasted sesame oil. Now, the sesame oil gives it that kind of nutty flavor, and, but it doesn't hold up that well to high heat, so I didn't add it at the beginning. I'm adding it here towards the end to get that, uh, that wonderful flavor. And I guess I, I wish you could smell this because it really does smell fantastic. Now, this is perfect as is. I'm like, honestly, you could absolutely put this over the rice and it's great. But I think the, the kind of trick to stir fry that is the hard thing to master, and I'm gonna turn this, actually I'm just gonna set it off here just for a second, is making it where it kind of has a sauce. and. The first time I tried this, I will be honest, it was a disaster. And this was when I was 18 years old and um, had been a vegetarian for a while. And um, I had read about making a slurry, which is what this is. It's cornstarch or potato starch or arrowroot um, with cold water. And this is going to make a bit of a sauce and thicken this up. And Really what I'm looking for is almost a little bit thicker than milk, almost the consistency of, say, heavy cream. 
um, is what I'm looking for. And you can always add more to your dish, but it's hard to take it away, meaning that I'd rather you add a little bit in, get it to the consistency you like, rather than dumping all of this in there. And I've, I've made too much here. I'm just, uh, but this is the kind of thing that there's not even a penny worth of materials here. But what I have to do is get my skillet nice and hot again. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of this cornstarch slurry or mixture uh, into my skillet. And again, I'm gonna do so by kind of pushing this to the side here for a second, getting this nice and hot. I'm using an induction cooktop, which um, if you're not familiar with that term, you don't have to use induction, uh, but it does get very hot very fast. Uh, so if, um, if you have an induction or if you work with induction, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it is very quick to get very hot. So I'm going to put a little bit of my mixture in here and this will almost immediately start to thicken up. So I'm gonna use this now to stir around. And again, all this really does is it creates a bit of a binder. And so it helps get that almost restaurant quality uh, consistency. But to get it to actually set, it has to come to a boil. Now again, this was so hot, it hit it and it was already starting to thicken. But again, it's not glue, but it does make the, the flavor and the sauce that we sort of made in the pan here with our sesame oil and with our amino acids and our little bit of ume, it makes it stick to every bit of the veg. So that's a great way to kind of like that, get that restaurant quality consistency and texture. If you are a meat eater, you could also put, you know, chopped chicken or thin slices of grilled beef, or what we often do is take either tempeh or um, the smoked tofu or just the extra firm tofu, and you can brown it in a separate skillet and then throw it in at the end. I wouldn't want it to just cook and cook and cook and cook because it becomes, uh, especially the meat items become sort of dense and chewy. So this is fantastic uh, on its own. It would also be good cold as a leftover, and I, I can't imagine that there are many of you that have not tried uh, leftover Chinese takeout cold the next day, or even later the same evening. Uh, so it's one of those things that on its own, it is fantastic, but on top of a brown rice, or last week we played with some, um, some red quinoa, and I also, we'll see in a minute, I always have things like uh, whole grain sorghum and millet and uh, amaranth and spelt. So any of those alternative grains would be fantastic on this as well. So, and we go with our veg. And I think this is one of those crowd pleasers. That little bit of, of fresh broccolini that we have, you can see the difference in the color. Um, I always say fresh first, frozen second, if you can't have the fresh. Uh, and then we go down the line to, you know, dried if you have to do dried, rehydrated. And then canned would be my, my last option. As, as we talked about in, in our previous visits in the kitchen here, there are some, some good canned things like our beans um, or um, certain things like uh, canned tomatoes, crushed tomatoes work really well. But in this particular case, I think, again, fresh if you can get it. If you can't get it, go with the frozen, but make sure you drain that liquid out as much as possible. Get all the excess water out because any of that excess water would just generate steam. And since it's already cooked, it just kind of makes it more weak and limp and, and just not, not so vibrant. Um, I always love to, uh, to garnish, even when we're eating at home. And I have so much mint growing in the garden right now. And I, I wish I could invite you over to give you cuttings of mint because it is ridiculously easy to root. Um, and honestly, a little mint chopped up on top of there would add a lot to the dish. If you ever had um, like the Vietnamese soup that's spelled P-H-O, uh, that's pronounced pho, and uh, that is usually served with a whole bunch of fresh uh, mint or basil or tarragon or even flat leaf parsley. If you have even a piece of land or a patio the size of this cooktop, you can do any kind of herb. They love a uh, little sunshine, obviously a little water, but they pretty much thrive on neglect. So they don't require much in the way of an expertise. You can, you can uh, if you have any spot to grow anything, herbs will do fantastic. And most of them are perennial, which means they come back year after year after year. Once you have mint, you always have mint. Um, so that is our quick little stir fry uh, for today. And again, you can take it in, in any direction, customize it as you like. But having seen so many of those boxed uh, little stir fry meals, uh, and again, nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, if that's what you have, that's what you have. But 
this is a very inexpensive way and a very easy way and a technique I think it's, uh, it's great to, great to kind of learn from. Um, I uh, just curious again. I haven't seen who we have. Uh, who do we have checking in with us, Mr. Hewitt? I've got my my again friend and producer Hewitt on my left hand, and I have my son Finn on my right hand. Um, and so what we got? There's Paul Gottsagan again. Paul Gottsagan, our vegan uh, vegan friend from the GCF. Stacy is saying hi. Stacy from the GCF. Person, yeah. uh, the home Mary team. Jane Reed. I'm not sure where she's coming from. There you That's go. Jasper. Okay. okay. Uh, Gloria Don Don Turek is from Asheville, North Carolina. All right, Asheville. I love Asheville. It's a great foodie town. Uh, Lynn Abrams, Kathy Atlanta. Day Atlanta. Let's see, M. Beth Snyder Finley, and then Laura Whitney, of course, who is also on the other end. Tommy Netzer is watching. That's fun. That's good. Hello there, Tommy from uh, from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Laura said, wow, I should have watched this video before my stir fry attempt last night. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. We were a day late and a dollar short um, <laughs> and a bok choy short, maybe. Yeah, right. um, anyway, it's uh, like I said, when we uh, when my wife and I, then girlfriend first started dating, I wanted to be uh, I grew up watching Yan Can Cook. I thought he was just magic and I loved his interaction with the, the camera and his sense of humor. And uh, that's always me trying to emulate Yan Can Cook and the Galloping uh, Gourmet and uh, Justin Wilson. I guarantee those are the guys I grew up watching, and I loved their sense of humor and their their ease. The way that they just waltzed through the kitchen was was pretty amazing. Uh, speaking of waltzing in the kitchen, if uh, Finn gets the camera here, we're going to go uh, against my wife's wishes. We're going to have a peek into the pantry, um, and I you know we did a little bit of tidying up, but honestly not much. We, we live in a very small house, and um, so we are very tight on space. Uh, but also know that I do feed a lot of people, not just my family, but there are times that I do a lot of cooking demonstrations and cooking classes, and so I've amassed a whole bunch of oddball things. So I'm going to walk into our uh, our very small pantry, which also happens to be our laundry room. So let me sneak in here and get out of the way. Um, we have, of course, uh, <laughs> some small attempt to try to organize this stuff, uh, and that's my wife Amy's doings. And this is this wasn't done for the show. Uh, she always does try to label things. Now it's up to us then to try to put them back, and that usually tends to be the problem. Uh, but in our rices and pastas, I also have gluten-free versions, even though, again, our family doesn't have issues uh, with gluten, but I do a lot of food for other folks. And um, we tend to have all sorts of shapes, whether it's um, you know spaghettis or lasagnas, egg noodles, penne pasta, and then we start getting into the, you know, the alternate grains. We have the brown rice, which is what I use today, which is actually the brown basmati, um, which I love. It's a longer grain rice and has that sort of chewy denseness to it. Um, and then sort of hidden in here, sorry, uh, amaranth, which is the smallest of those grains. It looks like little tiny, um, the, when I was a kid, I used to have sea monkeys and the sea monkey eggs looked a little like that. That doesn't make it sound very appealing. Uh, but anyway, just point of reference. Uh, so amaranth is super high in protein. Let's see, amaranth is uh, six grams for a tiny little little thing that it is. And then spelt, which uh, in German is called dinkel. If you ever had dinkel soup in, uh, in Germany. I have uh, Indian cream of rice and navy beans and sweet potato noodles. Uh, so there's always something in here from which I can springboard. Um, and of course, our canned things, mainly beans, a little green jackfruit, some uh, evaporated goat's milk, because of course, you know, in case you have uh, a need, uh, evaporated milk for when it snows for snow cream, veggie stock, I've got um, spirulina powder, kale powder, uh, blue magic, which is a blue algae powder, which makes your food incredibly blue, sardines, tuna, all sorts of fun stuff, you know, kids' food, cereals, uh, lots of stevia. So. I think it's a pretty standard, uh, you know, there's some, some things that I think would overlap with my, what might be in your pantry. Lots of different vinegars and oils, and again, let's don't look too far down there because it's not exactly uh, organized, uh, and that's my fault because I use lots of it. But anyway, that's, uh, that's basically our pantry. This used to be a back porch, so it's a very small space, uh, very confined, and so the outside world and garden is just outside the steps here. And then, like I said, we got washing machine, microwave, which sometimes gets used. But again, nothing too fancy. I think uh, people have this idea like of a chef's pantry being something crazy. And quite honestly, if I had the space, it might be crazy. So um, 
obviously um, you guys have to now return the favor and show me your pantries at some point. Um, you don't have to, that's just, a, just putting that out there. But uh, anyway, anytime we as a family are trying to figure out what are we doing for dinner, because quite honestly, there are those days where you think, what in the world are we gonna put together? Having a pantry that is stocked with some of those, uh, some of those items, again, the noodles, the grains, the rices, those sometimes become the platform. I mean, almost like when you're making pizza, you have to have the crust, whether it's made of cauliflower or whatever it is, you have to have some sort of a platform. So most of those things become then the springboard. And then when you are able to go to the grocery store, that becomes the fun part. And I know some of you are thinking, don't talk about when we used to go to the grocery store. Although I know a lot of you are still able to go to the grocery store. Um, but I typically then will let whatever is in the market, or if you're online shopping, whatever's on special, whatever's uh, you know in season or or on clearance, those are the things then that become the um, the highlights that go on top of that that base layer. So I think it's always a good idea to have those things, um, you know, some things like that uh, in the pantry. I won't invite you into the refrigerator today because who knows what's in there. Um, but I I do always tend to have little dregs of uh, jams or jellies or preserves or um, even if you bought a store-bought uh, you know marinade or something when you've got just that last little dreg that oftentimes then becomes a salad dressing I'll take you know if you have a jar with two fingers of, uh, of a good raspberry jam I'll then add three fingers of vinegar three fingers of, um, of a good oil some garlic, and then I'm out of fingers, no. Uh, and then just put the lid on, obviously, and then shake it like crazy, and you have an amazing, easy salad dressing, uh, rather than going and buying a, a pre-purchased, or, or sorry, pre-fabricated dressing that has, uh, the goal of those prepared dressings is shelf life and longevity. It's not about flavor and, and health and urgency. So um, I, if you're interested in making your own salad dressings, and we've done previous episodes kind of making those uh, those jarred, um, at home kind of a dressings. Um, the only caveat is when you make them, make sure you label them so that when you have a guest that wants to go for the orange marmalade, it might in fact be a orange marmalade vinaigrette and not something you can spread on your English muffin. So uh, I think we're sort of wrapping up on time. We got what a minute or three left here. Um, oh, I, uh, <laughs> my friend Karis uh, has saying she loved how we converted our porch into a pantry. Honestly, that was sort of done for us, but when we bought this house, this house is about 100 years old, um, they actually had a separate bathroom shower concoction back there, which uh, felt really weird. Um, so we gutted that and then um, literally had no space other than uh, that uh, to become the pantry. So that worked out quite nicely. It does get tight in there. So if there's more than one person, even Finn and I trying to dance right then to, to show off the pantry. Um, it's usually a one person job. I mentioned this last week, the kitchen time should be your time, right? So rather than thinking of how can I spend less time in the kitchen, we have my little um, air pod or whatever it's called, my little smart speaker behind the camera here. And so we'll say, I won't say it now because it'll start playing music, but we will ask our smart speaker uh, to play whatever music. I've been kind of hooked on uh, Big Sandy and his Fly Right Boys here lately. And that's the time for you to spend in the kitchen you know, rather than dreading the chopping and the, and the, the you know, separating or the whatever you're doing in the kitchen, get in that headspace that you have this time to kind of get in your own headspace. Or we have some bar stools here. Sometimes the kids will be sitting here doing their homework or taking a test or, um, you know, uh, drawing something or whatever. So it's, uh, I think the kitchen is the heart of the home. And I think it is a place that so much can happen. So rather than dreading your time in the kitchen, embrace that time in the kitchen. So, oops. Amy hey, Butler wanted to know, what did you mean by three fingers? By three fingers, that's a good question. Um, so that's that's kind of a bar keep uh, thing. Like if you want a shot, say give me two fingers of, of whiskey or whatever it is. So if, if you have a jar, so I don't have, this is not a great example, but if this was your jar, uh, so I'm thinking a typical jelly jar, I'm saying sort of proportionally, right? So you can, if you divided the jar into say five fingers, Right, so if you got five fingers worth, so I would want equal parts oil and vinegar. So, you know, again, if you've got two fingers of jam, I wanna have then three parts 
um, oil and three parts vinegar. Like I said, it's more fingers than I have, but essentially it's just a kind of a ratio thing. So that's a, that's a good point. I rarely ever measure anything. So it really kind of depends on how much, um, how much is left in the jar. So I, I guess what I'm saying is if you have one part jam, I would then go three parts vinegar and three parts oil. So I'm taking one finger being what's left in the jar. I hope I haven't overcomplicated that answer, but essentially it is, it's a ratio thing. Always when I make a vinaigrette, a typical vinaigrette is one part vinegar to three parts oil, but I usually do 50-50. So if I'm making a vinaigrette, the base of that vinaigrette is gonna be equal parts oil, equal parts vinegar, um, and then whatever flavoring you're gonna to add to it. So that's a good question, and I thank you for, um, for hitting me up on that, because I should have clarified that. So um, it is really kind of fun to watch these things. I can't watch what you guys are saying and look at the camera at the same time, but it is, uh, I appreciate that you guys took the time out of your day, either live or later on, even if uh, you're not watching this live, still comment. I'd love to see um, the comments as they come through. Um, and I appreciate you guys sharing this as it goes around. You know, it, it's fun because I know a lot of these folks and these are full stomached people and that's not a bad thing. Obviously I've missed my stomach, but it is, uh, yep, Hewitt's petting his stomach. Um, the stomach is not the most important part of digestion. All digestion happens in the intestines. and so. Uh, not to get overly complicated, the stuff that we do in the Gesundheit kitchen is relevant to anybody who eats food. So we do try to, uh, to kind of focus on um, the nutrition aspects of things without getting too overly nerdy uh, to where you, you start you know, overthinking it. Uh, I want it to be fun and somewhat urgent and um, a little spontaneous and but more importantly rather than writing down x amount of something it's more about the technique and about the having fun in the kitchen so uh i think we are time to wrap up and mainly because the food's starting to get cold and i have a crew that wants to eat the leftovers which always happens um and i'm bad about not taking the time to to sit down and eat a meal as well so i think i should do that we have one more of these scheduled for uh next thursday so we said we would do this every uh, every thursday in april uh, and then after that, we'll go back to our regular Gesundheit kitchen format where we do sort of semi-regular um, events kind of like this, not live. But now that we have got the hang of this live stuff, maybe we'll throw a live one in uh, every now and then just for, uh, for giggles. And, uh, but until then, take care of yourself. Don't go crazy. Don't, uh, don't annoy your family. Uh, don't let them annoy you. Easier said than done. Um, and enjoy your time in the kitchen. Until next time. Until the next time we meet in the kitchen, take care of yourself and go zone tight. You're supposed to cut the camera, Hewitt. I'm eating with my fingers.